Zealand because they took my pocket knife away from me. So I said, I'm going to pack this in my bag and I'm going to take it with me because this is, is a, not, not that it's a, a prized possession, but it's one of those things that every day there's a use for it. Two or three or four times a day, I find myself grabbing my knife and opening this or cutting that or doing whatever I need to do with my knife. And so uh, when I got there, I was all happy and I pulled it out of my suitcase because it traveled well, you know, and I put it in my pocket and everything was good until a man in New Zealand said, let me see your knife there. And I showed him my knife and he said, this is illegal in New Zealand. Okay. So I went back and I put my knife in my suitcase and I hid it under my socks because <laughs> I didn't want to get caught with an illegal knife in New Zealand. And I didn't want my knife, my knife, to get taken away again. You know, so there are some things in this life that are our favorite possessions. Maybe it's not a pocket knife for you. Maybe it's a, a bit of jewelry or maybe it's a, a, something that one of your kids have given to you or, or something that your wife gave to you or it's that, that, that special fishing lure that has just caught every fish in the world. And you think to yourself, this is one of my greatest possessions. And certainly there are material possessions in this life that we look at or material things that we see and we say, you know, it's, it's good to have those things. It's not bad or unrighteous or, or necessarily wrong to have those things. But there are certain things that are to us just great possessions. We carry them in our pockets. We put them on our shelves. We uh, maybe carry them in our purse or English leather carry-all or whatever it is. We keep those possessions with us. Tonight, I want to look at the Christian's six greatest possessions from first or second Peter chapter 1. In the first four verses, Peter gives us some of the greatest possessions we have as Christians. And it far exceeds the sharpness of a knife or the beauty of a diamond or the value of gold. It is something to us that is more precious than anything material that the world can give to us. These are the possessions of our soul. Possessions which when God looks at us, He is happy to see that we carry with Him. And just like that trusty pocket knife, we do not want to be caught without these possessions. The first one comes in 1 Peter or Second Peter, I'll get it right, Second Peter 1, beginning in verse 1, and it is the idea of faith. Our faith is one of the greatest possessions that we have. It tells us that Simon Peter, let's see if I can get it to go here, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of God, and our, our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Faith. We focus in on this because it is one of the things that we know that we can obtain because at one time we were without it. When we were children and we were growing up, we might have heard the name of Jesus. We might have heard uh, uh, the, the word God or Father, but to really understand the concept of who He was, to believe and trust in Jesus for all that He has done for us, that was something that we had to acquire with time. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. So we look at this faith, this trusting reliance upon God, and it's based upon the evidence which God has provided for us. The heavens declare the glory of God. Man is without an excuse, Romans 1 and verse 20, because everything around us is telling us that God exists, God exists, God exists. So in Hebrews 11, 1, he tells us that faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things that have not been seen. Our faith is based upon the evidence that God has presented unto us. Our faith is that which brings our salvation or opens the door to God's salvation. Acts chapter 16 and verse 31, when the Philippian jailer asked, What must I do to be saved? He said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, you and all of your household. He took him that same hour, washed their stripes, and was baptized for the remission of his sins. And so faith brings salvation. Faith binds us together with other Christians. Notice what he says here. It is to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing. The King James translation says of like precious faith. The word like or iso in the Greek 
pray or equal in this case means that 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 Peter who is this great apostle he is the rock apostle right Cephas and surely here is a man whose faith far exceeds anyone else's and yet Peter is quick to say that your faith the ones that I'm writing to in this generation and in generations that will come decades and centuries and millennia down the road that faith is a faith of equal standing as mine Peter is telling us that his faith is not special his faith is shared by every Christian and it binds us all together in the same group this same faith that would bind us together bears fruit in our lives that produces those things which God wants us to see what good is it my brothers if a if a brother or sister comes to you and is naked and destitute of their daily food and you say unto them go in peace be warmed and filled what good is it to you what have you done that was needful for their body James chapter 2 verses 14 through 17 faith produces fruits works as he would go on in verse 18 to tell us I will show you my faith by my works Faith is something that produces fruit. Faith is something that when we hold it and we cherish it and we show it to the world, it beckons others and draws them in to the love which God has given to us. Let your light so shine that others may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5 and verse 16. This is the faith that, that, is, that makes us bound for the heavenly realm. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When we have faith, faith that binds us to God, faith that brings us together, it is a faith that ultimately makes us heaven bound because it exhibits itself in works. It's one of the greatest possessions that we have. Secondly, though, in the same context, righteousness. The, the kind of living that God wants to see in us, this righteousness that, that binds us to justice and equity. The same faith that mimics Jesus himself. Again, in verse 1, Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who obtained a faith of equal standing with ours, but how did they obtain it? By the righteousness of God and our Savior, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Righteousness refers to the right ways that in this case, Peter says, are exemplified by Jesus Christ. He was a man tempted in all points like as unto us, yet he was without sin. Hebrews 4 and verse 15. That same righteousness that Jesus exemplified and showed how to live on this earth is the same righteousness we take to ourselves. Not that it is imputed upon us, but that we practice the righteousness which Jesus himself practiced. We put on, as Paul would say in Ephesians 6, the breastplate of righteousness. We walk circumspectly to make sure that our steps are following the paths of righteousness. This justice, this fairness, this rightness that we have is one of our greatest possessions. Because ultimately, righteousness is what will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Righteousness will take us to our home of eternity. So hold on to it. Don't let it go. Don't let it fly away. Don't let it escape your grasp. God has given us faith and God has given us righteousness to hold on to because they help us to be meat for heaven. Number three, though, grace. We think about grace and we become nostalgic for what God has given to us. As we saw this morning, the idea of a gift. God has given to us things that we do not deserve, things that we cannot earn, no amount of gold can buy them. No possessions of the earth. Uh, if we had everything the earth has to give is not enough to amount to one, the salvation of one soul. And yet God's grace is sufficient to save every one of us. God's grace is sufficient to save every soul of history. But not everyone takes this possession which God has given to us. 
So we think about grace. And notice in verse 2, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and our Lord, or our Jesus our Lord. He's already mentioned that Jesus is our God and our Lord in verse 1. He repeats it again here for us in verse 2, that we may look upon Jesus and know Him for who He is in His greatness and His divine splendor that we are acquainted with Him. But He says, May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Grace. Unmerited favor. We think about grace and what it does for us. And, and we see that, this, that, that grace was, was first of all sacrificial. That God was willing to sacrifice His Son in my stead. Though I didn't deserve it. I never will deserve it. God sent His Son to die for me. That's sacrificial grace. That's the kind of gift that God has given to me. God has given me that sacrificial grace so that it might also be a saving grace to me. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. Titus 2 and verse 11. It is a saving grace because not only did, was it willing to sacrifice His Son, but because of that, He was willing to pull us out of our sin, to pull us out of iniquity and set us on the path of righteousness. It is God's sustaining grace because even though I've obeyed the gospel, I know that there are times in, in where I am weak and where I fail and where I still sin. If we say we have no sin, we are liars and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1, verse 8 and also in verse 10. We sin, but God's grace sustains us. It, it follows us every single day. It's the possession we never want to lose. And it's the, it's the grace of God that, that shepherds us through the trials and tribulations of life, protecting us from all the things which would seek to harm us. Grace. It's the gift which God has given, and we hold on to it as this precious possession. We keep it in our pocket, in our heart, knowing that God has given it to us. Number four, peace. Peace. That peace which passes all understanding. The peace that the world cannot know, Jesus said. The world cannot know as long as it is in its, its, its iniquity, as long as they are separated from Christ, as long as they are on the outside of God's grace, they cannot know this peace. Oh yes, it's offered to everyone freely. But only those who have received it gain that peace. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. We think about this peace that defies logic, Philippians 4 and verse 7, that passes all understanding. It is a peace that comes to us in the middle of an embattled life. It's, it's not that we're free from turmoil. It's not that, that conflict doesn't arise in our lives. In fact, there is a, Paul says, the things that I, I, I don't want to do are the things that I do, and the things that I would do are the things that I don't do. He says, there's this constant struggle in me in Romans chapter 7 between uh, uh, my desires and, 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 you know, of the flesh and my desires of the spirit. There is conflict. There is conflict between the Christian and a world that, is, that is, is ever drifting further and further and further away from God. There is conflict all around us. And yet in the midst of this embattled life, God says, have peace. Yes, it is a peace that passes understanding, but it is a peace that comes in the midst of conflict. We're not wrestling with flesh and blood, Ephesians 6 and verse 12. There's a fight happening, he tells us in Ephesians 6. But he says, put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. We still have peace in the midst of an embattled life. Peace with God. Sin. Remember, sin is, a, is an angry fight against God. It's an affront to Him. And, and when, we, when we just simply said, well, that's, that's my life, that's my sin, we're saying, God, uh, it doesn't matter that we don't have peace with you, but God says, repent and turn back to me so that there may come a season of refreshing, a season of peace with God. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. 
And if we have peace with God in this life, then we will ultimately have peace with God at the judgment. Paul describes in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 3 those who are going around saying peace and safety, but then sudden destruction comes upon them as, a, as labor pains upon a woman who has been pregnant. There is a peace, though, that is going to give us peace at the judgment where we are not bowing down and pleading with God for salvation. But in Psalm 1, he says we are standing, standing before God. Why? Because we are at peace with Him. Number five, one of the greatest possessions you have is the knowledge of the way of salvation. The knowledge of God. Intimacy with the right ways and how to live your life. My people were destroyed for a lack of knowledge, God would say in Hosea 4 and verse 6. They were destroyed because they didn't know me. They didn't know my law. They didn't know the right way to go, and they tried to do it on their own. And as a result, they were destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Paul would say, or Peter would say in this verse, verse 3, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who has called us to His own glory and excellence. He has given us everything that pertains to our spiritual life and ultimately the eternal life and our godliness that we might know how to live in this life, our righteousness, and He's given it to us through the knowledge of Him who has called us. The knowledge of the right ways. The knowledge that will lead us to salvation. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection to share in His sufferings, to be conformed to His death. I want to know Christ. Philippians 3 and verse 10. I count all things, Paul would say in Philippians 3 and verse 8, as refuse, as trash, compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. One of the greatest possessions we have is a knowledge of God and who He is. A knowledge of His Son, Jesus Christ. And a knowledge... That I have been saved because His Spirit bears witness with my spirit. Romans 8 and verse 16. That I have obeyed the gospel and I am saved. And then finally, number six, the promises. Oh, the promises. You know, the world makes a lot of promises that it cannot keep. In comparison though, Peter says that these are great promises. Very great promises. By which He has granted to us His very precious and very great promises. So that through them you might become partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped from the, the corruption that is in this world. Because of the sinful desires. Think about the promises for just a moment. Two explicitly are given here. One, that we might be partakers of the divine nature. That is, that we can come to know God. That, that we can experience God's nature, which is eternal, because He's offering to us eternal life. Second promise He mentions specifically is that we might overcome sin, having escaped the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desires. Overcoming sin, victory, eternity and victory are two of the great promises that God has given us. But, but notice how He describes it here. His precious and very great promises. The King James says, exceeding, exceeding precious promises. And the phrase is very similar to what Peter uses in verse 1 in talking about his faith. And he says, look, our faith, as great as you may think I am as an apostle, uh, you have obtained the same faith of equal standing faith. But he, he kind of plays on those words. And he says, this isn't an equal promise. These are exceeding great promises. You know, the world says, I'll give you this and I'll give you that. But those promises are not on an equal standing with the promises of God. His promises 
far exceed them all. And so we know what we possess as, th as these qualities are in us that we are prepared for the heavenly realm. Faith, righteousness, grace, peace, knowledge, and the promises. And we put those in our pocket and we hold them. These are for Christians. These are for those who have obeyed the gospel. And for those who are on the outside looking in and they're seeing our possessions. We show them to the world not to flaunt them. We show them to others to say, you can have this too. You can have these possessions. If you will come. And we hold them out to you tonight. If you're not a child of God... God wants you to have them. In fact, he would later say, if these qualities are in you and growing, you will not fall. Won't you take these possessions from him tonight? Won't you come while we stand and while we sing?